us anyway. Thank you that God is not a Christianity is not about perfection. It's a relationship. And we thank you today that you want to have a relationship with us. God, we are blown away by that fact. And God, we want to say, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, your presence is heaven to us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Step across the aisle and just touch somebody by the hand or on the shoulder and tell them you're so glad to be in the house of the Lord with them today. Would you do it? Touch somebody. Encourage somebody next to you. And you can remain standing because we're going to observe communion today. When you came in, you should have gotten one of the communion element containers. If you need one, wave your hand in the air like you just do care. We want everybody to have the communion elements. It's such an honor, isn't it? To be able to take part and what Jesus did on that Passover night, on the eve before his crucifixion. Because you and I are a part of what Jesus did, but more importantly, we're a part of what he's doing. Jesus talked about the bread. He talked about the wine or the juice in our case. And he reminds us that we're continuing what he started. As you hold the bread in your hand, Jesus said, this is my body. In other words, he said, this walk, this way, as the early church Christians were called the those of the way, before it was called Christianity, it was called the way. Jesus said, this is the way we do things. We sacrifice ourselves for our fellow man, for our neighbors. We don't do anything to them that we wouldn't want them to do to us. We don't say anything to them. We don't want to say them to say to us. We respect our neighbors, right? We respect their differences, our differences. And we rejoice in what we have in common. Jesus says, eat in remembrance of me. The Jews, Jesus said, this is a new agreement, a new covenant said, instead of you having to keep all the rules and regulations to be righteous in my sight, I'm going to impute my righteousness. Impute, that's a theological term in its original. And it's the same idea as when you're born and you have the name of your parents imputed. Or when you immigrate to a country and receive citizenship that citizenship is imputed to you so as an individual because of your belief and your faith in Jesus Christ salvation and righteousness is imputed to you that's what it meant when Jesus said this is my blood and this is a new covenant he says drink in remembrance of me thank you Jesus anybody glad that he did that Anybody thankful that he shed his blood? Are you grateful that he gave his life? Anybody thankful that he didn't give us what we deserve? Are you appreciative today that he didn't look uh, at your faults, but he looked beyond your faults and saw your needs? I'm glad that in 2022, there was some difficulties and there was some challenges, but Jesus came through and he did at, in 2022 what he's done every single year of my life. He provided every need. He gave me everything that I needed and he loved me. He saw me through. If it was a mountain, he saw me over it. If it was a valley, he saw me through it. Anybody glad that God is an on time God that keeps his word? Hallelujah to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And it's not make-believe. The world will begin to believe in Jesus again when the world can believe in Christians again. And I pray that you and I will be the Christian in 2023 that the world in which we live can believe in. 
So I don't know about you. I believe in him with all of my heart. I know that Jesus lives. I know that my Redeemer lives, as Job said. I know I can't explain him, but it's because he's unexplainable. I know I can't answer every question that somebody has about him because he's unanswerable. And you see, I, I, can't, I can't put him in the box of your understanding because there's no way to understand and comprehend him because he transcends all that we use to try to explain him. That's why he gave us his word. The Bible is God's word to the world about himself. And he said, this is what you need to know about me. Does it tell us everything about God? No. John said, I guess if it was written everything that Jesus did, the world wouldn't be able to contain the books. The Bible is just God telling you what you need to know. So anybody comes up to you and say, well, you know, the Bible doesn't answer that question. You can say, well, it's not trying to. I hope that you recognize today we've got so much reason to be excited about 2023. Can we take just a moment, maybe take somebody by the hand and let's pray for our neighbor to have every need met, to have every sickness healed, every problem, every infirmity, every question answered, every problem I should say solved. Father, we're praying for our neighbors right now. We're praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ right now. We don't know what they need, but we know that you are the need meter. And that God, you are our soul restorer. And God, you are our healer. And we bless you today. And you promised us years ago that God, around the communion table, you would heal bodies. And we pray that you'll do that right now. If somebody came in needing you to heal them, we pray you'll do it. There's so many in our congregation who are suffering with COVID right now. Heal their bodies. So many, God, who are under the weather, heal their bodies. Many are visiting and on vacation. Keep them safe and bless them. Restore their body strength. Help them to, uh, to have their strength back, God, to start this brand new year. Let their vacation restore and renew their minds, their bodies, and their spirits. Bless everyone here. Bless everyone watching. And we thank you for the God you are in 2022 and in 2023. In Jesus' name, amen. Give him one last hand clap of praise. Just because he's so good. Thank you, Jesus. You can be seated. I want to remind you of Psalm 128. I like a psalm. I like a scripture that's got the word happy in it multiple times. Psalm 128 has happy in it multiple times. And what's interesting about it is that Israel is singing this psalm as they are going back to uncertainty. They're going back to Jerusalem, and they didn't know what they were coming back to. They didn't know what to expect. It's like coming back home after being away from home months and maybe even years. Many veterans I counsel with during the week after being deployed sometimes years at a time didn't know what they were coming back to. That's kind of the way Israel felt when they were singing Psalm 128. But it wasn't about their circumstances. They were confident in the God of their circumstances. And they said, happy is everyone who fears the Lord and who walks in his ways. They sang, you will surely eat what your hands have worked for. You will be happy and it will go well for you. I wanted you to know this song because we're starting a brand new message series today. Entitled, Falling in Love Instead of Falling Away. You may get discouraged in 2023 like you did in 2022 but let this be a reminder of you, to you that you're going to be blessed when you continue to stay in that relationship with God God's not only going to see you through it He's going to see you to it and the it is the promise hallelujah to God and the psalmist is a reminder of that you know all year last year we avoided the temptation to do a sermon series and those of you who have been in this ministry for any length of time, you know, I've done hundreds of them. But in 2022, we didn't do a sermon series. You know why? Because I felt like life was a series in and of itself in 2022. We had drama. We had unexpected trauma. We had uncertainty. We had a lot of great things happen too. 
But 2022 is one of those years that at the end of it, we're just going, Phew. sounds like just about every year we've had before it. <laughs> but 2023, what I've heard from the Lord, will be a year of great blessing when the children of God learn to fall in love with Him all over again. Because a love relationship with God is something that even trauma will not be able to destroy. Even something tragedy will not be able to sever. A love relationship, an intimate relationship with your God is something that politics and political things not going to be able to interrupt. It's something that other opinions are not going to be able to separate. Your relationship with God is going to be the source of your greatest blessing in 2023. Anybody love Jesus? Twelve of you. Praise God. The rest of you, maybe before the end of this service, you'll fall in love with Jesus because your flesh wants to fall away. Your flesh just wants to to get out of the thing. Anytime it's hard, the flesh wants to go the other way. Anybody can relate? I want to remind you today that God has not given up on you, so don't give up on God. I want to thank everyone for being so generous this year, partnering with the Unity Home Care and United Outreach Services by giving the gifts. You took the names off the Christmas tree throughout the month of December. You are so gracious and so giving to buy presents for these families who are in need in our community. And God bless you for that. So many families had Christmas this year because of destiny now. Thank you. And God bless you. Give yourselves a hand, but let's give God glory in the process. But you know, giving is not something that only happens uh, at Christmas one time a year. I told the early service congregation, bring your water that we give to the community through the almshouse all through the year because people don't just need water when it's hot outside. People need water all year long. And we are giving those cases of water to the community through the almshouse here at Hope Mills every week. So don't forget to still bring your cases of water. But if you've got an extra blanket, we are still in the share of the warmth blanket drive during the winter season but socks come in handy anybody get your pair of socks in your fruit bag last week anybody worn those socks yet <laughs> they work they do they're good socks thank you pastor jay for that your christmas socks i've seen folks come into my office with christmas socks on in june they're socks no matter if santa's on there they're socks but People still need these items to keep warm. And I know it's warmer now, but anybody know North Carolina weather, you know that it's, it's most likely going to get cold again. So thank you for helping us with that. Continue to bring those waters. I want to encourage you, and I'll let you go. Uh, let the uh, message, the uh, announcements be over after this. Men of Destiny will resume our meetings uh, February the 4th, that's February the 4th, that's a Saturday at 9 a.m. right here at the church. We're going to have breakfast together, men, and a special devotion. So put that on your calendar, February the 4th. We won't do that this month, but February the 4th, we're going to kick it off again. Anybody been blessed already uh, being a part of Men of Destiny? We're going to try our best not to let anybody get shot like, like last time. Some of you are like, what? What did he say? I was taking a nap, but the preacher actually said something interesting. Yeah, we had an accidental shooting. <laughs> so, But he's okay. Matter of fact, he's doing great. And he's healing just fine. But he wasn't from our church, but he was still a brother in Christ, right? Anybody thankful for the building that God gives us every Sunday to worship in? We're so excited. We are in a building fund right now. Because the Hope Church has actually stopped meeting here like they've been doing for the last several years. And they have their own place right down the parking lot. But that means this is our building. We still have to keep it up. We're looking for other churches to help share the expense, other organizations. If you've got special events that you would like to, should be paying to have in a facility anyway. 
why not have it at your church and, and use that money to continue to sustain the building that we're worshiping in. We're asking you to give a little bit extra for the next few months uh, as we are transitioning from having the Hope Church to maybe looking at having another church come and joining us. Join us, Lord willing, to help us with the, uh, the I guess, the requirement for this building to be able to worship here every Sunday. So thank you for considering that. Has God blessed you? If God's blessed you, then we as Christians are to bless back. That's what this offering is going to be about. If you don't mind taking a moment to get your offering ready, you can give by texting to give. The number is on the screen. Just text an amount to this number. And through the Breeze software, secure software system that we use to check you in when you came in, that should, so we'll know you, that you're not just someone passing in the night, so to speak, that we'll know who you are. That same software is uh, used, that secure software is used to take your offering, and we thank you for that. But you can also give at the kiosk in the back, and there's a basket here. You can give the same way I give, the old-fashioned way. I did this morning already. God bless you for giving. Let's stand, and let's believe the Lord is going to, to minister healing to Wanda and Jeff Bleacher, who are sick from the Convergence Church, and Wanda sings on the praise team. Pastor Josie. Gore, if you're watching, Dr. Josie, we know that you're recovering from surgery, and we thank God for the healing in your body. We love you and miss you. We pray for Pastor Deborah and Don recovering from COVID, Donalda recovering from COVID, Soliday, who normally sings on the praise team, uh, Brother Ed recovering from COVID, Brother Paul has an ear infection today, normally plays. We could go on and on, right? So we covered your prayers, but we're going to pray over this offering that as we give, God's going to bless not only financially, but physically and mentally and spiritually too. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. We pray that as we give today, you'll continue to open up heaven, pour blessings out on your people. It's what you do, and we're thankful for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship in giving. If you want to bring your offering, fellowship in the process. God bless you. Anybody found him to be faithful? That's who he is. He's faithful. He's generous. He's so good. And we want to look at St. Matthew's gospel for a few minutes. And you know, all of the gospel writers uh, had a special perspective from which to write about the gospel. And most of you know that each of the writers did uh, glean from each other. As they were writing their gospel messages, the, uh, the, I guess the most recent of all writings in the scripture are the gospels. Uh, the Bible is not recorded in chronological order. You know that. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written after the epistles of Paul. And we're excited to uh, say today that as we're looking at Matthew, Matthew had a special uh, goal in mind when writing the gospels. He wanted the readers to see that Jesus truly is and was 
the fulfillment of the Old Testament promised and prophesied Messiah. And what we look at, at this on this first Sunday of a brand new year is that God has not changed. He's still the same today as he was yesterday, and he'll be the same tomorrow as he is today. And that's not, that doesn't mean that he, he's stale and out of date. That just means that there's still a lot left about God for you to learn about. And so I hope that you'll be encouraged in 2023 to draw a little closer to God. Maybe fall in love with Jesus just a little bit more. Maybe seek for just a closer walk with him and a little more, maybe a lot more intimacy with God in 2023. Instead of letting maybe the rhetoric of society, maybe the hurt that church or church people have caused you in the past to call you to cause you to fall away. And get disenfranchised with church. That's one of the things on my YouTube channel I'm really trying to, to encourage. I notice in the culture today there's a lot of people who are falling away from Christianity. And, and to justify falling away from Christianity, they endeavor to deconstruct the teachings of Christianity. But what I've noticed in reading behind these individuals and listening to these individuals is that simultaneously... In the process of discrediting the church and Christianity, they're also discrediting God. And when I hear that, I say, whoa, wait just a minute. Just because church people have goofed up, just because the church hasn't always done just right, doesn't mean that God is messed up. God ain't made no mistakes, y'all. Come on, somebody. Now, I'll be the first one as the leader of a church to admit we've done some stuff wrong. We've done some stuff right. But church and the church people, church people, we haven't always treated people rightly. And I want you to know that one of the ways to begin to treat one another better is to learn to love each other. And one of the ways to truly get connected with God like never before and be able to receive the wonderful blessings that only come from being in a relationship with God is to begin to love Him and to begin to love Him starts with getting to know him and we get to know him through his word Matthew chapter 7 we're going to get there in just a moment just two verses verses 13 and 14 I'll share with you today in the kickoff message of this sermon series falling in love instead of falling away that there are many reasons why people get discouraged in their walk with Christ but I believe it's very difficult to quit on God when he is the love of your life I have found the opposite is true. People can leave a church. People can leave the church. People can leave Christianity when they never truly connected with Christ to begin with. I've heard people who were born and bred and raised in the church walk away from Christianity because they felt justified to do so because somebody they noticed was hypocritical. Or somebody was arrogant in their faith. Or because somebody hurt them. And as a licensed mental health counselor, I find that every day. Some people come to me and knowing I'm a pastor, look at me at the first session and say, now I don't want any preaching. I don't want to hear none of this God stuff. And I'll say, absolutely. And they're always the ones within six weeks who want to talk about the God stuff. It never fails. Never fails. But the fact is that you and I need to realize that, that the religion of Christianity is man-made. But the, but the Christ of Christianity is almighty God. He never changes. And in 2023, your relationship with him is going to be the greatest thing that you can do. And you see, God is not up in heaven saying, well, you'll be lucky to have a relationship with me. No, the God of the Bible is a coming down kind of God. He's the kind of God that will step across the valley and climb over the mountain and, and go through the fire just to get to you to say, please have a relationship with me. That's the kind of God the God of the Bible is. Now, religion and people who are religious will be people who will tell you what, what they want you to hear. And there will be individuals who will hurt your feelings. And sometimes the truth hurts. But I'm talking about hurt your feelings with rhetoric and tradition. That's not God. 
and falling in love with God instead of falling away today is what I have heard from the Holy Spirit for you. See, I believe it's very difficult to quit on God when he's the love of your life because like any relationship, our relationship with God can be difficult. We know that's true. But when we are truly in love with God, we will persevere. I've been married to the same wonderful woman 33 years as of yesterday. Thank you. 33 years she's put up with me. And I can tell you there were times, like the person said, have you ever thought about killing your spouse? And she said, no, but I thought about murder. I mean, um, divorcing your spouse. She says, no, but I thought about murder a bunch of times, you know. Maybe you're, you're in it for the long haul, but the fact is y'all don't always like each other, you know. The fact is you can be upset with God. You can even be angry with God. But when you love God, falling away is not an option. Leaving the relationship is not an option. St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 are a couple of verses I've heard used plenty of times to illustrate how true Christians are willing to do the difficult things. That's what it's about. But it's not about God saying, now as a Christian, if you're going to follow me, you better suck it up, buttercup, because it's going to be difficult. That's just the way it is. No, that's not the attitude that Christ uh, uses in Math St. Matthew chapter 7, 13 and 14. The attitude is, look, I know it's going to be hard taking the high road. I know that people aren't going to always treat you well. I know that it's going to suck sometimes uh, living as a Christian. But I promise you it's going to be worth it. The reward is going to be more than worth it. That's how he says it. And I want to unpack this with you today so that you can see that. You see, it's true that we're going to go through difficult things. But these things are necessary to please God. Even though we see others around us taking the easy road. And I think that's why fellow Christians, sometimes we criticize each other. Because we see other Christians maybe being able to get by with some things when it comes to their relationship with God that we don't feel like we can get by with. That's the whole story or the whole meaning behind the story of the prodigal son. You remember the prodigal son who took his inheritance and went off and squandered it, came back and wanted to get back in good with his dad, and the older brother said, why you let him back in the house? I ain't never done like that before. To you, I've always been righteous, and I've always done right. And here you let little brother come back after he squandered it. <laughs> I think that's what I've noticed is that behind most of the contention among Christians. And the reason why a lot of people are falling away from the church is because they get mad that, that we expect of them this level when we're living at this level. I ain't talking about y'all. I don't want to get fired. But here's what he says. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is narrow and the way is constricted that leads to life and there are few who find it. Isn't this a powerful verse? Now, first of all, I want you to remember, this is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth on his own free will and bled and died and suffered for people who didn't accept him, who loved people who didn't love him, who died for, for people who deserved to die. He died a death he didn't deserve, if you'll pardon the alliteration. For a people who should have died the death that we did deserve. And here he's saying this word, these words. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. Anybody ever quoted that to that old sinner that you just wanted to put them in their place? You've got to go through the narrow gate. The behind that is like I did. <laughs> That's what's behind it, Pastor Jeffrey. you got to go through the hard stuff like I did. Because if you don't. I'm a, I'm, I don't mean to preach yet. Here's the idea. For the gate is narrow and the way is constricted that leads to life and there are few who find it. To accurately understand this passage and know exactly what Christ meant and not use it to blast people or to put people in their place and tell them they're going to hell. You've got to understand what Jesus was saying. The first thing that you've got to remember is what 
verse preceded these two verses. The golden rule. Before you quote these two verses, please add verse 12 in the post. <laughs> that that you would that others would do for you. Do so unto them. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Narrow is the gate. It's so hard to treat people who aggravate your life out almost completely out of you the way you want them to treat you. It's hard to treat people well when they hurt you. It's hard not to give somebody back tenfold because I know Desi and our folk are bad to fight. When somebody do, does you wrong, you can give it back to them tenfold. You can do it. I know you're able, but are you supposed to do that? Here's the idea. The word translated gates in this passage, it's a metaphor for opportunity. And metaphors aren't something that some uh, liberal preacher creates to try to uh, water down the Bible and, and preach that there's no hell. I believe there's a hell. I believe there's a heaven. I believe there's righteousness and I believe there's unrighteousness. I believe there's bad and good and I, I believe all of that. I believe in the Apostles' Creed. I'm not that kind of preacher, but I'm the kind of preacher that you sent to school to learn how to rightly divide the word of truth so that I can preach it and you can go behind me and find out if I'm telling you the truth. But Jewish tradition Throughout the Old Testament, there was always these comparisons that the life lived for God is not an easy life, but the reward is great. But on the other hand, the life lived for the flesh can be pleasurable at times, but the end is nothing. That's what the Greek word that is translated destruction in this passage means. It means loss. Wide is the way and many who go down the path that leads to nothing. To loss. What is destruction? There was a, a physician who practiced in town. Uh, had a practice in town recently. You probably saw that on the news. Had a gas leak. His home exploded. And absolutely nothing left. You saw the picture? Beautiful home. Gas exploded. Nothing left. I think some individuals in his family were killed. He was, actually he was my doctor too. Some of you may know him as your doctor. But he was... Uh, one of my doctors as well. My heart went out, prayed for him and his family. But that's what destruction is. It's loss. Many people take this passage as a salvation passage. It's not. It's a discipleship passage. Narrow is the gate that leads to heaven. To get to heaven, now you only got, you only got a small way to get there. And then to get, get to hell, everybody going to hell. That's the same Jesus who just said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The same Jesus who just said that, come unto me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Is the same Jesus in just a few verses later who said, do unto others as you would have them to do unto you because narrow is the gate that leads to destruction and, and few are they who go down it but broad is the way that leads to loss because not every Everybody is willing to love each other like Jesus loved you. Am I talking to somebody who was well loved by God because he reached way down in the midst of the miry sin of your life and loved you despite the life that you lived? Can you return that kind of grace and mercy to that person who has hurt you? Not too many people can. That's a narrow gate. Gate is way. It would be contradictory, as I said, for Christ to say in one breath that his yoke is easy and his burden is light, and then in the next breath to suggest that getting to heaven is nearly impossible. Come on, somebody, but you know, you, you may have done it like I have, but you've definitely heard Christians who quote that passage as if it's that hard to get to heaven. It's not that hard to get to heaven. If, I can, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, what? We shall be saved. For with the mouth confession is made and with the heart we believe to righteousness. That's how it works. But discipleship is a different subject altogether. Jesus came not just saved but to make disciples. 
That's two different things he did. You can follow it throughout the scriptures. He came to say, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. St. John chapter 3, 16 and 17. It was never God's plan for the world to go to hell in a handbasket. God gave his own son. He didn't give like his general, his five-star general in charge. He didn't give his, give his stepmother or his son-in-law. He gave his own son. You better believe he had a good idea it was going to work before he would give his son. But he's not talking about getting to heaven. He's talking about getting heaven to you and me. That's discipleship. That's winning the world in 2023. That's sharing with somebody the love of Jesus that Jesus shared and showed to the Samaritan woman. The love that Jesus showed to the ones who crucified him. And he said to the Father, lay it not to their charge. Forgive them for they know not what they do. Do I have a handful of people in the room who want to start loving like Jesus in 2023? We can lose our salvation because somebody didn't smile at us at Burger King at the drive through Now he's meddling. But Jesus looked square in the face of people who were killing him, taking his life. I've heard people tell me, if you're trying to hurt me, you've had a bad day. And I believe it. Like I said, you're bad to fight it, Nessie. Now, I don't, want, I don't want to get on your bad side. And the fact is, though, that's Jesus we're talking about, who in a moment, I love this part when I think about it. The Bible says, he, Jesus said, don't you think I couldn't ask my father and he would send a legion of angels? You know how many it took to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? <laughs> it didn't take, but well, really it was just two. Yeah, because the, the angel of the Lord was Jesus. But here's what blesses me. God. Jesus didn't need an angel to destroy anything. Because he's the Alpha and the Omega. When he, when everything that's created was created, it was created out of his mouth. He's the Logos, John chapter 1, verse 14. Come on, some, come on, somebody. The flat God became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only of the Son, of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh, the Word of God, the communication of God. Jesus is the communication of God. If Jesus wanted a tree to be in a place instantaneously, all he had to say was tree. <laughs> he can speak it. He didn't need a legion of angels. He didn't even need one. Because he's the king of kings and lord of lords. He's the beginning and the end. And my, my point is this today, is that what matters to him more than anything else in all the world and the universe is you. And that person you're upset with. And that person you don't show grace to. I know they don't deserve it, but guess what? That person looking in the mirror doesn't deserve it always either, does he? Does she? You talk about a narrow gate. We get so caught up on personal convictions. And we throw this passage out as Christians all the time. I tell you what, you got to live a lot more narrow life than that to get to heaven. no. All you got to do is say, Lord, I'm sorry for my sins and believe in God and you can go right to heaven. But are you going to get, is God going to be able to get heaven through you to the world? That's discipleship. How many people are you going to bring with you when you go? Because Jesus says, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. It happened, it's the same, the same is true for you when you and I get to heaven, we'll get to heaven or the judgment throne of God pretty quickly and when we come, our reward will be with us. Who we bring with us, that's the reward. You understand it? I don't want to come by myself. When Jesus told the parable about the talents, you remember the one who buried the talent? Didn't bring anything with him? He said, I can go back and get the one. <laughs> What he was saying is, look, when you get to the judgment seat of Christ and the only life that you've influenced positively is your own, you may get to heaven, but you've missed the point. You've missed it. Jesus said, that one who at least got 
back double or maybe was given two talents and was able to get two back and the one three and however many it was. The idea is that with what God has given you, he desires you to make more from that. Because the divinity in you is an investment. In this passage, we notice in verse 12, in everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. You know why they say he said the law and the prophets? Is because the law is everything that is, and the prophets is everything that's going to be. In other words, if you want to be righteous, care about people. If you truly want to be Christian, love people. Realize that Jesus loved in a very diverse way. He ministered to Samaritans in a different way than he ministered to Jews. And he ministered to people who were unsaved. The woman who had the issue of blood, you remember that? When she came up to him, that was a serious thing in his day. I mean, you come up to the wrong person like that in this day and age, somebody who is protected by security, and you're probably going to get hurt. There's just some people you don't run up to. And that's, that's how important it was to keep this law. This cer- it was ceremonially, ceremonially unclean for this woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years to touch a master of the law. To touch someone who is in the position of Christ, if you will. Children were not supposed to come up to a leader of the law. But Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me. When this woman touched him, he said, who who touched me? (laughs) You know why? He said that because the need of that individual was more important than all the ceremony and ceremonial teachings and doctrines there were in the world. Let us not hang on to our convictions so tightly that we lose the world around us, church. Have you ever felt the difference between flying coach and first class? I got the opportunity once or twice. When it comes to being conscientious of the person seated next to you, it's a big difference. At least for me, when flying coach, I always try to be careful not to monopolize the armrest. Coach is so narrow You don't know where to, I don't know where to put my elbow. Does their elbow go in the back and mine in the front? Or does their go in the front and mine in the back? Some people's elbow takes up the front and the back. So I'm just supposed to. And this is very uncomfortable to sit like this. Has anybody ever tried to sit on a flight? Your arms are not, I mean, just naturally your elbows poke out. You know what I'm saying? And then they allow you a carry-on, which is a joke. You put it down at your feet. They shouldn't call it a carry-on. They should call it the footstool or the footrest. And I try so hard for my my carry-on not to get over in their foot space, right, or feet space, however you want to say it. And then I try to coordinate my trips to the bathroom so as to inconvenience the person on my left or right as little as possible. But flying in first class, you don't worry about that stuff. I mean, the person feels like a mile away from you in first class. I mean, I sometimes, that one time I got first class, I I was thinking, man, I could just put my elbows anywhere. And I could put all my luggage where my feet go. It was that much space. That's the idea about the narrow gate. Think about it, if you will. When something is smaller or narrower, it forces you to be more conscientious. Enter the narrow gate. Be more conscientious about the verse before, verse 12, about how you treat people. That's what he preached to the religious leaders all the time is, look, you're you're, you're expecting the people to do all this stuff, but you're not practicing what you preach. Hence the reason why the churches are becoming more and more empty because we... You must calculate how you're going to get all that stuff home that you bought from Lowe's if you drove your Prius and not your pickup truck. Have you ever noticed that? I drive a two-door Wrangler, and and I like to build stuff in the house, and most boards are eight feet long. And I'm always trying to find a way to get eight-foot-long boards into that little two-door Jeep Wrangler. Somebody walked by me the other day at Lowe's and said, 
get a Jeep, they say. It'll be fun, they say. And I said, right. <laughs> Where's your truck, man? And the idea is that we continue to recognize that we can do it the easy way and not suffer inconvenience at times. Yeah, we can write people off. We can not talk to people anymore. We can just say, hey, whatever. I was going to say something, but you better not say that in church. We just say, you know what? Forget you. Right? Forget you. I don't need you. I don't care about you. But that is not Christian. In 2023, fall in love again instead of falling away. Find a way to rekindle that love that burnt out in 2022 with that person. Find a way to fall in love with this God who's always been there for you, who you've gotten mad at, and you've said a few choice words to him, but he hasn't walked away from you. There are people in your life who promise that they would love you forever and a day, and you, you may have done something uh, to hurt their feelings, or maybe you did, did something to deserve for them to leave, but the fact is they promised they would never leave. There's only one, though, that I know who will keep that word, and that is Jesus. Have you noticed him to be there? Have you noticed him to be faithful to his word? <laughs> if you haven't, I, I hope that you will understand this. The idea in this passage is Christians, we are much more careful how we treat people. And that is the narrow gate. You say, preacher, how does this really, how does this help me? Because God wants you to know that the disciplined life, the, the, the life of a disciple of Jesus Christ is the blessed life. And God is saying, look, I, if I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, John says this, then I will come back to receive you into myself, that where I am, you may be also. In my Father's house are many mansions. And I love this part. Jesus says, if it was not true, what? I would have told you. So I'm going to tell you ahead of time that loving people who are unlovable is difficult. Forgiving people who do unforgivable things is difficult. But if the reward wasn't great for doing it, I would have told you. And Jesus is saying, look, it is, a, it is a difficult road to hoe, but I'm telling you, it's going to be worth it. It might not just be your future that you that is blessed as a result of forgiving people and loving people unconditionally. You may be able to change someone's eternal destiny. Because you chose to love them and not give them what they deserve. I've seen that in my life recently. Individuals who are very, very mean, spirited in what they said to me or what they posted or what they wrote to me. But instead of just getting defensive and writing them off, I'll say something like, well, that sounds like you're very upset about that. Let's talk about it. And a lot of times, that's kind of like opening the floodgates, isn't it? You give a, a person a chance to say what's on their mind, even if it's about you. <laughs> and a lot of times, they'll say it. And it may not be what you like. And you know what? If we're a child of God, if they're right, we're going to tell them they're right. We're going to accept it. Am I talking to a handful of people at least? Because it, it's not Christian for you and I to say that we're in the image of God when Jesus himself, Jesus himself was transparent before God in Gethsemane. Jesus himself was transparent before the Father on Calvary. And I hope you recognize that's why you and I stay at the feet of Jesus, because we're not perfect. We've got stuff in our life that needs to be changed all the time. That's why I can't judge you. I can't judge you because you know what? You may be ahead of me, and I may not have the understanding about things that you have. And I think you're, you're the one that's messed up. It's just because I, I don't understand it yet. That's why my attitude and the, the mentality, the, 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 just the mannerism of the Christian should be, I'm, I'm still teachable. I'm 40 years old. I'm 50 years old. I'm 60 years old. I'm 80 years old. Whatever age you are. And I'm still learning this thing. So who am I to judge? The Christian. We don't pursue the reward of being able to say that we live more righteously than our neighbor. We're not trying to be able to say that we suffer more or have the capacity to keep a lot of religious rules more than our neighbor. But our reward is just that, being a disciple of Jesus and the thought that it pleases him. Nothing makes me happier than knowing the love of my life is happy. I just want her to be happy. 
The older we get, the less we want for Christmas. We just want our kids to be happy. Anybody ever feel that way? You remember Chrysostom? Chrysostom or Chrysostom? He was an early church father, and he served as Archbishop of Constantinople. He was famous for as a church father because of his denunciation of abuse of authority, both church authority and political authority, because Christians choose the high road. The narrow gate when it comes, or Christians choose the high road or the narrow gate when it comes to how we treat others. And that's why I want to quote Chrysostom. He said this about this very passage in St. Matthew chapter 7, these two verses. And I quote, he clare, talking about Jesus, my yoke is pleasant and my burden is light. So how is it that he says here that the way is straight and narrow? Even here, he teaches that it is light and pleasant. My question is, where? It doesn't look like it. Oh, he, say, he answers, for if sailors can make light of storms and soldiers of wounds in hope of perishable rewards, much more when heaven lies before and rewards immortal, will none look to the impending dangers. It was a literature method that the writer used, that Jesus used. To say, hey, no matter how hard it is, be willing to do the difficult things as a Christian. Keep on loving him. If you like REO Speedwagon. Keep on loving him. No matter how hard it gets. No matter how difficult it is. And what did he say? By this we'll all know that you're my disciples, that you have love one for another. No, listen, God, I'm going to come to church every Sunday. I'm going to worship loud and everybody. I'm going to dance in the spirit and speak in tongues. And my God, I'm going to be holy and I'm going to give the missions, but I'm not going to like some people. Anybody ever known anybody like that? Very religious. That's what I talk about when I'm talking about religion. I'm not downing religion. But when we're about religious practices without truly having the heart of God, then we don't get this passage. But we get this passage when we begin to recognize that it's all right to be like Joshua and like Job and say, take this whole world, but give me Jesus. Come on, somebody. I know that my Redeemer lives. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Job said, blessed be the name of the Lord. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Why do people do that? Why are people like Polycarp, ancient church fathers, willing to be burned at the stake? Why does Mother Teresa uh, go to Calcutta and live in very poverty stricken locations for years when she could live a lot better than that why is it that people like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. speak out against injustice and incivility and for civil rights and endanger his life why do people do things like that? Because we know that there is a reward at the end of the day. There's going to be a father at the end of the road who has a robe waiting for me and has a ring waiting to put on my finger. I wish I had an ounce of Holy Ghost in this place who's willing to worship him up in here. Because we know that the reward is great. My YouTube channel, I'm really doing my best to encourage people who have been discouraged. And a lot of young people go to college and learn a little bit of history and think that they can absolutely reconstruct or deconstruct all the teachings and the tenets of a, of a faith, Christianity, that's been around for thousands of years. There's a lot more to it than just what we see that we don't like. And I try to post videos that say, look, yeah, there are a lot of things we've done wrong in the church, but don't turn your life away from Jesus because the church has hurt you or because there's hypocrisy among Christians. Don't give up on Jesus. My God, I'll tell you, every single time I've been in a situation that was just drastically terrible and traumatic, it was not easy to keep my faith in Christ, but there were times that I only had him. He was the only one I had. 
And I can tell you after these 50 plus years, I can't tell you one time he's let me down. And every time I think that it's about that moment that I'm going to have to stop saying that he's never let me down, he comes through in that moment, in that final hour. And in 2023, it's not going to be any different. God already sees what you're going to go through. He knows what is ahead of you. That's why the Bible says the Lamb of God was slain from the foundation of the world because God knew you would sin. He knew that I would sin. And so he sent his son to the cross before you were ever born just to provide for the salvation and the forgiveness that you would need. Chris Ostham goes on to say the very circumstance that he calls it straight contributes to make it easy because of the reward. By this he warned them to be always watching. This the Lord speaks to rouse our desires not to cause us to feel guilty or scared that we're not going to make it through the narrow gates. You know it's like the movie 2012 and they were all trying to get on those ships and the doors were closed and they were running. It was like Indiana Jones trying to to, to go go under that stone wall that was closed and he had to stick his arm out to get his hat last thing. Anybody ever feel like that's the way getting to heaven is going to be? I mean, the door is closing. The door is closing. I'm going to have to slide under the door like I'm sliding in the home just to get to heaven. No. He said, come unto me, all you who are labor and who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jeremiah 33 and 3, call on me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things. But the Apostle Paul said that it's like it's, Christians got to live right. Absolutely, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, your living right has more to do with how you treat other people than how you dress, whether or not you go to the movies, whether or not you drink. More than all of that, it's about how you and I treat other people. I got to, I got to close it, Pastor Jay. I'm, I'm done. But I want you to know, for the Christian, we don't pursue the reward of just being able to claim righteousness because my righteousness and yours is filthy. But when I do the will of my Heavenly Father, that's righteous. It's imputed to me, the Bible says, as as righteousness. It doesn't motivate most people to do the difficult things just so they can miss destruction. Have you noticed that? If you truly believe in something, you'll risk your life for it. If you truly believe in someone, if you don't believe in that, just talk to a veteran for about five minutes. So it doesn't make sense that this passage would be used like so many use it. Broad is the way that leads to hell. No, broad is the way that leads to loss. Hell is reserved for those who refuse to accept a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's how you go to hell. You don't go to hell for trying your best and messing up every day. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you mess up every day, guess what? You're going to heaven. If you believe, if you have confessed your, with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised you from the dead, you're going to heaven. But heaven is a life. Heaven is an existence. That everything you did or didn't do is going to be applicable. We'll give account for our life here, there. It doesn't motivate me to be told that if I don't do the difficult things, I'm going to be destroyed. But what motivates me is that when I do and I'm willing to do the difficult things, I'm going to please my Father. This person who I'm absolutely in love with named Jesus, I'm going to bless him. Now that'll motivate me. I believe that'll motivate a lot of people too. See, love does motivate us to do the hard things. Hate doesn't. The scary tactic doesn't. There are many who fall away because one of the most difficult things to do in life is to consider others ahead of ourselves. So I encourage you to take the high road. Enter the narrow gate. Believe the unbelievable. And remember that all things are possible. 
I'll challenge you to restore a broken relationship this year. What? He could have gone the whole sermon without saying that. Somebody that did your wrong, somebody that you are considering never talking to again. I'm not saying that you've got to go out and call them or write them a letter or take them to supper. I'm saying, why don't you allow yourself to be open to God possibly doing something in that relationship? And because you've heard this message today, when that happens, you'll recognize it. And you'll say, oh, that, that's what God was talking. Okay, well, and it might be that someone you ordinarily would not have talked to again. The opportunity to talk with them is going to arise and you're going to think twice about it. Not necessarily to restore that relationship because you know what? Some relationships are not God's will for you. That person that you were married to, that you're no longer married to, that may very well have been God's will for that person to no longer be in your life. You know why? Because that person had the opportunity to have a relationship with you that, was, that would produce something good and they chose not to. And God himself says, I will not always strive with man. So we can't expect people to put up with something even God's not willing to put up with. And you can't live with somebody who is absolutely unwilling. But I'm talking about the relationships that you can do something about. Maybe not to fully restore, but to heal. The falling in love instead of falling away applies to those relationships too. So with your heads bowed for just a moment, I want to ask you, is that relationship with Christ an intimate relationship? One that you can be honest with Him and He can be honest with you. If not, I just want you to ask Him right now. God, help me to connect in 2023 with you on that level. I want to love you, Jesus more than I love anybody else. I want you to be the love of my life. And then God, from that rela this relationship between me and you, I want your love to pass through me to somebody else. I want to be able to love the soldier who is beating me. I want to be able to love the people who executed me. But God, I know that that's a love that seems absolutely impossible. But maybe what is possible is loving that person who lied to me. Or somehow finding a way to forgive that person who stole from me. Or maybe being willing to forgive that person who stabbed me in the back. Who caused me to lose the promotion who caused me harm and I'd never done anything but good for that person. Maybe you could help me find a place in my heart to forgive them. I'm not going to forget necessarily, but I can forgive. And it's not going to mean that I'm not going to hurt anymore about that, but maybe it just means that if you can love me, I realize that I should be able to love everybody else. Father, I pray for this congregation this year that somehow I'll be able to serve the role that I'm supposed to serve, but the Holy Spirit, you'll make up the difference because I know you have spoken to me about this congregation for this year. And that, Lord, great rewards and blessings are ahead of us as we remember that you truly do keep your word and that you are real. And that, God, a loving relationship with you can counter so much of the evil and the bad that happens around us and even to us. So let us treasure, Lord, help us to treasure our relationship with you more than anything else in 2023. That means that we're going to serve you, we're going to worship you, we're going to give to you, we're going to live like you and love like you, God. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand to your feet and let's give Jesus praise one last time. Put your hands together and give him a hand clap offering before you leave. We love you, Jesus, and we praise you. Thank you for joining us today. If you don't have anything else to do next week, come back. We'll be right here, Lord willing. God bless you. We'll see you next week.